Computers have been used to generate music since the earliest days of the personal computer. In fact, one of the original eureka moments in the early Altair community was when somebody figured out that the EMI emitted by an Altair could be picked up on an AM radio, and the resulting audio frequencies that were heard could be varied based on timing of loops that the 8080 processor was executing. So this person sat down and wrote a small program that could be entered on the front panel of the Altair along with data that represented a song and play some music. We're going to demonstrate that here quickly today. I've already got the program entered into the computer in a couple of songs, the uh, little folk song Daisy, and then a short snippet from the Beatles of Fool on the Hill. It's going to run from zero. We're already set to zero, so I'm ready just to hit run. I'm going to turn the radio on, turn it up a bit. You might be able to hear some of that interference. All right, that just about does it. Let me stop it and turn the radio off. Now, as crude as that sounds, that was actually a major milestone in the early days of the Altair. The AM radio had become the very first external I.O. device for the Altair. At this point in time, no teletypes had been hooked up. There was no basic. It was basically just a box that you could do nothing more than demonstrate that you could examine and change memory with the front panel switches. Maybe run a program that added two numbers and look in memory and see that it had done it. But this represented actual use of the Altair computer. In fact, when this was demonstrated for the first time at a users group, it's actually a fairly large users group, the crowd literally erupted in applause because they were so excited about what had been done here. So, interestingly, an AM radio is the first I.O. device for a personal computer. All right, so over the next few years, the personal computer market just exploded. The Altair bus became accepted as a standard and was standardized as S100. All sorts of computer companies started popping up, making boards for these computers, and of course, a lot of them made computers themselves. And uh, as you might expect, some of the boards that were made were boards for generating music. And these would do much better than the Altair through a radio. They would play multiple parts so you could have harmonies and uh, make some really good sounding music. However, they were very expensive. These weren't cheap boards, and so unless you were really serious about music, it was unlikely you'd go spend the money on one of these boards just to have it for the fun of it, you know, to play music now and then to show your friends. One exception to this, however, was a music system sold by Processor Technology. Right here is the actual S100 board for this system. Hopefully you can see it. Um, this really is an S100 board. Right here it picks up ground, and right here, it's picking up a bus signal called Interrupt Enable. Now, the Interrupt Enable signal can actually be controlled from um, the computer software. The Enable Interrupt instruction sets that line high. The Disable Interrupt instruction sets that line low. So the software is actually able to use that line as a crude pulse width modulator to generate three-part music. And it did a pretty good job of it. If you look closely, the audio goes through a resistor and a capacitor. That right there sets up a low-pass filter, and then it goes through one other capacitor on the way to your output, and that's just the DC block. So literally, the hardware required just three parts. It's a pretty slick little idea here. Then they included software that you could write um, music in and, of course, edit and play it as well. Now, on a side note, the company that made this product is called Processor Technology, they earned quite a name for themselves with some really good boards, and they also created a pretty iconic and important microcomputer in its own right, the SOL 20. And uh, frankly, that deserves its own video series, and I may do that in the future. But feel free to look that up and learn a little more about processor technology. It's an interesting company. But meanwhile, I'm going to do a video cut, and I'm going to install this board in the Altair, and then we'll take a few minutes and listen to what it can do. All right, we're back. I have the board installed inside the computer. Let's take a quick look. You can see it down there in one of the Altair bus slots. And the audio cable runs out here to this Bose amplified speaker so we can hear what uh, hear the music. All right, the music system was distributed on cassette 
um, the software program along with a few demonstration songs. Back in these days, floppy disks weren't very common yet, and so that's why it was on their cassette. And there wasn't really an OS to load files or load the program with uh, either. So the music system expected a monitor ROM, one of Processor Technologies products, to be present in the system to do console I.O. and to also load and save programs to and from cassette tape. And there's actually two ROMs it could be. One was called Solos. That was the SOL operating system for the SOL 20 computer. Not really an operating system, more just of a monitor ROM. And then there was another version called Cutter. Basically the exact same thing as Solos, but instead of running on the SOL 20, it made a three-board set they sold called sus, excuse me, Subsystem B that would run in most any computer. It could run in an Altair or an MSI for that matter. But this Altair doesn't have those boards in it. It just has normal um, Altair boards in it for serial I.O. And so what I have done is I have ported the cutter ROMs to the Altair serial ports and to the Altair cassette port. So this computer, as far as the music system is concerned, meets all the requirements in that the cutter ROM is present. It thinks it is. So alright, let's go ahead and do this exactly like we would do had we just bought the music system. Alright, we've got the monitor ROM up at F1000. So we'll examine that address and run from that address. And now we're running in the monitor ROM. I'm going to set those to zero because that is actually looked at by the uh, software later. Alright, so over here on this monitor, we'll take a look at this now. Give me a second while I get this to look right. All right, the greater than prompt up there in the left corner, that is the prompt of the cutter um, monitor. This is a typical monitor where you can enter commands to examine memory. For example, I can dump, uh, let's dump the ROM itself, the first uh, 256 bytes. Uh, you can use a command to change memory. You can execute from an address, that kind of thing. This also provided commands from loading, uh, for loading programs from tape, any file for that matter, into memory and saving them. The get command retrieved a program from cassette tape. Now, I don't have the Altair cassette ACR in this machine, so I can't use the get command. And besides, the Altair cassette was very slow. It was about 300 baud instead of what uh, processor technology used, which was 1200 baud. So it was about four times faster and frankly more reliable. But I don't have that in this machine right now, but I did add a couple of new commands that will load and save files over a serial port um, in Intel hex format. So that's what I'm going to do here today. Instead of the get command, I have an hget command. It's going to load the exact same program except through a serial port. So in the real one, we do a get. I'm doing an hget from port 1, which um, technically is the second serial port in the system. Port 0 is the first serial port, and that's the console. All right, so it's telling me to send the file. Right, we can see it loading here. This is actually the music system file as if it had come off cassette, but again, we brought it in through a serial port. And this is how you do it on the real one. And now you'd say execute from address zero. So here we can see the music system is up and running. This right here is the address of the program buffer or the, the source file for the music. The same start and finish means that uh, there's nothing in there at all. If we list what's there, it's empty. All right, now we want to load one of the demo programs, or the demo songs, I should say. Well, the music system itself did not have commands. It just allowed you to drop back into the cutter ROM, the cutter monitor, in order to do your loads and your saves. So it added a command called return, which you can see returns us to the, the cutter prompt. So here you would do a get to get a song from tape. Again, we'll do the hget instead. I'm going to go send that file. All right, this is Lay Down Sally by um, uh, Eric Clapton. And now we'll execute at zero again to go back into the music program. Now you can see that we didn't get the banner. Once it's been initialized once, the program knows that. So then when you re-enter it at zero each time you do something in the monitor, it, uh, it just comes back to its uh, normal prompt here. All right, so the first thing you have to do when you put in a new file is tell the music system to go look at the file buffer and size it. So now it runs from 8D3 to 10F0. You can see we have something in there now. And actually we could list it now to see what the source looks like. So this is the source for songs. The M's are measures and music measures. These are line numbers, sort of like in basic for the editor. And you can see quarter notes and, and other things in here. I don't claim to understand how to write music, but the manual tells you how to write it. 
Now the person who wrote this, let's, get, let's take a look at his credits here in the beginning. Now they're not in this file. A um, gentleman named Matt Lee did these arrangements uh, back in the 70s. and Very good job on these songs. All right, so the next thing we have to do is essentially compile this into a, a runnable um, piece of music. A score command does a compile. So it's placed it from 10F1 to 17D1. So the file actual source is below that. Now it's ready to play it. To play it, you just type play. And uh, let's take a listen and compare this to what we heard earlier on the AM radio. If you look closely at the IMTE light, you can kind of see it changing with the music. It is the, uh, it's the pulse width modulator. Let's see if I can get that darker so the light's easier to see. All right, you get the idea. And we'll go back to the monitor here or back to the music program. And at this point, if you wanted to edit that song, you could, or you can return back to the monitor and you could use a save command to write it to cassette. Or in our case, I can do an H save and, and save it back out to serial port. But that's the music system by processor technology. Again, it was just so much cheaper than anything else that was out there. And the way they did it was so innovative that it has always really, really impressed me. Now at this point, you typically hear me talking about uh, the computer used today was an Altair clone. But obviously in this case, we used a real Altair uh, because we had to plug the board into the S100 bus or the Altair bus. However, you clone owners don't need to be disappointed or those who are following the clone because this exact same system will run on the clone and work the same way. The reason is because the clone also has the INTE light and that light is driven by the INTE signal off the bus in the real computer so even though we don't have the bus in the clone, it does have the exact same signal and this will work. So look for that video soon. I'm going to duplicate this and do it on the clone so you can see how it's done there.